today we are putting the Artex 80 piece alcohol marker set to the patented Nato Soup Studio field test. I have an illustration already prepared. This was inked on Strathmore 400 series plate Bristol using a Sakura Pigma FB. These are pigment based markers that are water and alcohol marker proof. So if you're looking for something to do your line art with, I highly recommend you give those a go. So I already have my color swatches prepared. I have my markers nice and handy in this lovely carrying case that was included with the Artix alcohol markers. And I've also secured a blender marker. Now there isn't a blender marker in this set. So I am using a Blick Studio blender marker and you can get these very inexpensively through dickblick.com. You can also probably, we're gonna find out, you can also probably use a Copic blender. I believe we did a blender fluid test here with Blick, with um, Ranger, with, where is the Copic? Copic and Shinhan Twin Touch. So we tried various different blender solutions. So Blick should work fine. So I am gonna move my color reference sheet over to the side. I'm gonna move my markers sort of out of the way. So I have room to focus on our dragonfly queen here. So one of the first things I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm gonna start picking the colors I'm going to want to use for the full illustration. And I want her to be a green, black, and blue dragonfly. So I'm gonna start selecting those sorts of colors. I'm also going to go ahead and select the colors that I'm going to use for her skin tones. All right, so now that I have a pretty good range of colors selected, I'm gonna go through and kind of cull the colors, double checking against the actual swatches and numbers here on my swatch sheet. So now that I have my colors kind of sorted and figured out, I'm gonna start by applying a blue, and this is 183, which is phthalo blue, which is kind of a light blue, like a sky blue. I'm gonna apply that to the sky in the background. And what I'm doing is I'm applying it in circles and I'm really trying to saturate the paper. And the reason I'm doing that is I know otherwise we're gonna get kind of a streaky finish since all we really have to work with is a chisel tip and a bullet nib. So I'm really trying to get the best results out of this that I possibly can. And that means saturating the paper so that it can't really take much more ink. Now, ideally I would have applied masking Prisket. Unfortunately, I have no idea where my masking Prisket is. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to kind of roughly fill it in, leaving a bit of a halo around the character. And then I'm gonna go in with a bullet nib and kind of tighten it up. And already I find the marker body to be quite tiring for my hand. It's just slightly too big. Now that I have the majority of it filled in, I'm gonna go ahead and start tightening in the color. And then I'm gonna kind of go back over it and give it another layer. And what I'm really trying to do is I'm just trying to minimum, minimalize streaking or uh, obvious differences in application. And to me, that's what really makes uh, bullet and chisel tip alcohol markers so difficult to use is you end up with a lot of streaking, a lot of overflow of color, a lot of bleeding. So you can see there's some streaking up there. 
and the paper is also curling as the alcohol inks evaporate. Now I'm going to go ahead and give the sky another layer and that's going to help kind of minimize the streaky appearance. And we want to work quickly but neatly because alcohol marker dries a lot quicker than watercolor or water-based marker and that makes it more prone to sort of streaking when you put another layer on top of it. Of course, working quickly and going over areas multiple times kind of increases the likelihood for making mistakes. And you guys can see as I'm applying another layer, you can tell where one layer end ends and another begins. So the next thing I'm going to do is I want to use a really light green. So I'm going to take number 48 and I'm going to start sort of delineating the tops of our blades of grass. And now applying the blue had kind of an interesting effect on our paper. It made it curl up, which is really unusual for alcohol markers and it's making it a little bit difficult to quickly and accurately apply this next layer. So I'm using my left hand just to kind of hold it steady so it doesn't move too much as I marker. This also allows me to rotate the paper somewhat freely so I can get the best angle possible. So this is why we didn't affix this to like a solid surface. All right, so next I'm going to use number 47 and kind of blend between 48 and 47 until I get sort of the color I want. And I'm kind of aiming for like an early morning sort of feeling. That's why there's still dew on the grass. So I've got the base for the sky and the base for the grass. I'm going to go in with number 56, which is mint green. And you guys can't see me do it, but I've been cross-referencing my swatches for all of this. I recommend you do the same if you're working along. And I'm going to use this color to kind of add some depth, add some shadow. And we're just going to continue to blend out with the prior colors. You guys have probably noticed that I've been working on everything in sort of discrete blocks. That helps prevent sort of streaking. It also just makes it easier for me to handle. And I started with the background because the background will here and there sort of leach into the foreground character. It's easier for me to correct it if I've already, if this is uncolored and the background is what's colored because as I work on this, it's gonna push 
these colors towards the back of the paper. That's how alcohol markers work. So since I want some of these to read as background, like even further in the background blades of grass, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of fill them in entirely and leave some uncolored. And then I'm going to go back and kind of add shading and rework it. And you can see how I'm using the prior colors to sort of blend things out, make things um, mesh a little bit better. Don't be afraid to sketch and embellish outside of your line work to add things that weren't in the original line work. If you're working from like a stamp or if you're working from a sketch, that really helps personalize it. And it just kind of makes the whole image look a little bit richer. Now I'm gonna add another layer of this green towards the bottom of the stalks as well as underneath our little dew drops. And then finally using 50, I'm gonna add kind of my, whoa, what the heck heck happened here? That's new. I will clean that off and then we'll get back to coloring. Ugh. Are you tired of your alcohol markers looking like a mess? Well, we have an easy solution for you. You just need some rubbing alcohol. Spray it onto a paper towel. Be careful not to get it onto your work. And then use the paper towel, avoiding the nib, to just clear off that excess alcohol. Fantastic, so easy to clean. You can even use a Q-tip to clean the inside of your nib. Now, you don't have to worry about alcohol ink spattering all over the place. All right, seems like I have one leaky marker. I know it wasn't leaky when I did the unboxing swatch. So I'm actually going to leave the lid off of this one while I do my blending, just because otherwise I would be cleaning the lid every single time. And before we get too much further into this tutorial, I will point out that these Artex alcohol markers were sent to me. They were just sent to me. They had contacted me about reviewing their watercolor brush markers. I'd agree, I did the, the review. And then some Artix alcohol markers showed up on my doorstep, so. These were provided, but I was not compensated in any other way for them. But I figured you guys might appreciate an inexpensive marker tutorial since this is pretty standard for inexpensive alcohol markers in terms of performance and color range and price. So the methods I show you guys in this tutorial should be useful for Ohuhu markers, for markers purchased on AliExpress, for alcohol markers purchased on Wish. So what I'm doing down here is a technique called feathering out. So we have a rough edge that we've applied using the darker marker. And then we just kind of blend in using the next color lighter. And that's gonna give kind of a feathered, uneven blend. So it's gonna look a little bit more natural. And that's great for things like hair and for grass, for clothing. And we've also been working from yellow towards the sun to blue green. So we're working from light and bright to dark. And as we work dark and desaturated, i.e. the blue green, it's pushing that back into the distance. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm using Feathered Blends to imply that she's casting a shadow on the grass around her. All right, so I think that is about it for the gla uh, grass, almost of the glass right now. So we used 48, 47, 56, and 50 on the grass. And we used 183 for the sky. Next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to use 75 to shade the whites of her eyes. So we're just casting a little bit of shadow. Now I want to start on her crown and I'm going to show you guys how to color transparent objects. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our sky color 183 and we're going to just kind of loosely fill in the translucent areas on her crown and I'm leaving a border because that's going to help give the impression that there's actually a material between our eyes and the sky. You can also accomplish this by filling it in with a lighter version of the same color. And then I'm gonna go over this with 75, which is sort of what I've designated as my shading for white and translucent things. And what this is gonna do is it's not only gonna add a little bit of color to the gossamer, but it's also going to push that blue back just a little bit. And we're gonna use a similar technique on these dewdrops. So I'm gonna put in a little bit of blue on that one since it kinda covers or goes over into the sky. And then we're going to use our second lightest green. And we're going to kind of fill it in towards the bottom. So we're gonna do sort of a teardrop shape with many of these, but we're leaving a white halo around it. It's okay if you fill it in by accident, we can always go back over with either a blender marker or with like a white Signo or Copic Opaque White. Now we're gonna take our 75. And we're mostly gonna fill it in towards the bottom on top of the color we already applied. Now, if you like what you did and you don't wanna do this, that's fine. You don't have to do this. What it's gonna do is it's gonna lighten the color a bit, push it backwards. It's also going to give a bit of shadow to the white. And I'm going, and I'm going to do, or at least I'm gonna start that on the fan, on her wings and on the dress because we have a lot of translucent stuff. See, we're really just kind of hinting at it since it's not necessarily delineated in the line art. I'm sorry, these caps are actually very hard to get off. For the wings, I recommend keeping your strokes long and breaking it up a bit here and there. Now here I found an area that I missed the first time around. So this is a good opportunity for me to go back and correct my mistake. Let's start doing the same technique here on her dress. So we have both her legs and the grass. We're going to start with the grass because I haven't yet decided everything about her costume yet. And I'm trying to follow the motion of the fabric. She's going to switch to a darker green for the area behind her. and that will hopefully imply distance. OK, 
Okay, so next I'm going to start in on her skin. I've already selected the colors I'm gonna use. So I'm gonna start with my lightest, which is salmon pink, so number 25. And I'm coloring in small circles since we're dealing with a chisel nib here. I want to get good coverage and this will help prevent streaking. You want to use kind of a light hand because these uh, bullet nibs are fairly scratchy and there's a possibility that they may abrade the paper surface. Now I'm going to take my blender marker and I'm going to just use this to sort of add some highlights here and there. And what this is going to do is it pushes the color towards the back of our paper. All right, so I'm going to use number 25 again. And I'm using this to sort of create a darker version of the same color. All right, next I'm going to start applying the first sort of peachy blush tones to the skin using number 28. And if you find that it looks a little too harsh, you can either use a colorless blender, which will push all the color back, or you can do a little bit of blending with the skin tone we just used. A little bit of blush on the knuckles and on the bust, as well as on the palms of the hand and the pads, the bottoms of the fingers. Now I'm gonna go in with a darker pink, number 18, peach. And then I'm gonna shade with number 29, Barely Dej. And that's barely showing up. So I may need to select a different sort of shadow color because we're not necessarily getting as much contrast as I would like. But we'll try giving it one more application. All right, so I am going to use 147, which is kind of a warm purple color to do the shadows on her skin. And I may go back over that with 107, which is sand. So if you're kind of unsure about a shadow color, it helps to kind of test it out in the area that's going to be the darkest anyway. And then I wanna find a pinker pink, so I'm gonna use 140. And I kinda want something even pinker than that for her lips, cause they're still kind of blending in a bit much. So I used 140. We have to slide on over to 16. Coral pink. I'll set that aside. Now for her eyes, I'm going to start with a really, really light yellow green, 163, green vice. And I'm gonna set that aside for a little while and we're gonna start on the darker areas of her outfit. So we're gonna start with a very light black. We're gonna start with BG number five. 
And when you're markering or watercoloring, and you're not 100% sure where all your colors are gonna go in your image, it really helps to start with what you know and then expand from there. And for coloring in these small areas, you wanna use a really delicate hand because if you let the bullet nib rest on the paper for too long, it's going to bleed out. Art is a lot like cooking, where you will season and you'll rework things until it fits your own taste. Often there isn't really a finished point. It's just whenever the artist or the creator feels like it's finished. So I'm still deciding whether I want to do her cowl in this sort of, uh, if I want to go black with her cowl or if I want to do like a blue or a blue green with her cowl. So I think, I think I'm going to go blue. So I'm going to start with number 67. And that's a really pretty color. I'm going to give it another layer, but I'm leaving a little bit of rim lighting over on this side of her head. So that way we're gonna kind of build up layers of color. Now I'm going to use number 63. And I could blend it out, but I think I'm going to leave it as it is. And then we're going to use number 70. And this one I might blend out a bit because it's kind of a stark transition between the prior color. So I'm going to use this blue do the tops of her eyes and then I'm going to take green vice which is 163. I'm just gonna kind of push that back some zoom in so you guys see what it does to the eyes. So I think I'm gonna use the same blues on her arms and then on her leggings. So I'll go ahead and I'll start her legs. Okay, on to 70. Ah, no, not on to 70 goof there actually on the 63 it's not a big goof but you know goofs happen i'm really usually really good about putting my markers back in the order so i will sort them in the order i'm going to use them and then i try to always return them back to the, where they should be in color order and that way i can normally just grab without looking but i was not so good about it that time So I'm leaving a little bit of rim lighting along both arms just to help add some volume. Now we're going to use royal blue. And we're also going to use 63 cerulean blue to blend that out a bit so we don't have such a strange transi transition. So I'm gonna move on now to her bodice. And I want to use number 58, which is kind of a blue-green color for the majority of it. Actually, I don't know why I'm being so precious with those because I'm gonna color this black probably. Okay. 
go ahead and give it a second coat. All right, then number 57. And we're kind of using this one now to do some of the shade and the form development. And you guys see me make that weird movement with my hand because these markers are really hard on my arthritis. So I'm trying to keep my wrist somewhat loose. All right, now I'm gonna blend that out with number 58. Although they're so close in color, there's almost no need to blend them out. All right, I'm gonna give that a moment to dry. And the reason I'm gonna give that a moment to dry is that with alcohol markers, when you do wet over wet, that's when you get a lot of blending. When you do dry over wet, or I'm sorry, wet over dry, that's when you get like a, a cleaner delineation between the colors. Now I'm using 53 for some of our darker shadows. All right, so I want the pattern on her bodice to be a really dark blue. So I have number 69. It's kind of crummy about bullet nibs is it's not as easy to get them into fine spaces as you would think. And they tend to bleed a lot. All right, so I'm gonna go back to developing our black now since we've got kind of a nice base for everything. So I'm using BG7 as our next shade. So I'm building up to a black. Thinking about form and as how, and as form turns away from the light source, it gets darker. So I'm thinking about where my light source is and sort of developing highlights and contrast. And then, you know, as colors start to develop, you may decide you want to add more contrast to say the skin or to the bodice. And that's what I mean when I say that coloring is a lot like cooking. As you progress, the flavors develop, the colors develop, and you may decide that things need more salt or more acid. So I'm gonna use 107 which is sand, just to add a little more contrast to her face. And if there's anything that's not quite right, obviously you wanna double check with your swatch sheet, but you can always kind of push it back a little And then another layer of coral pink on the lips. And maybe even a little bit of dark Prussian blue, just to kind of add a little more contrast. I mean, once we start developing the black, it's really going to add a lot of contrast. It's really going to get dark. so I don't want to add too much. Okay, so next thing I want to do is I want to fill in our skirt. I think I want to use, hmm, number 68 looks like it's a good fit and I can't really get much lighter within that color family. 
So I guess that's where I'm going to start. And what we're dealing with here is kind of a transparent tull. So we want that like light frothiness that ballerina tutus have. So I'm following the same direction of the fabric that we followed when we did the undercolors. And we are leaving some white highlights here and there. And we can always go back in with say Copic Opaque White or a white signal and we can add white highlights back in. But I will say these bullet nib markers, it's difficult to do the sort of detailing I want to do. It's really hard on my hand. It takes a lot of control and a lot of practice. So if this is something you're struggling with as well, it's not you, <laughs> or it's not just you. Okay, so I'm also going to go ahead and do the fan using the same method I showed you guys in the crown. And the way we did her skirt is basically the same method as well. And you see, it's not really smearing the color. It's just kind of pushing it back. So if we were using um, water-based markers, this would be more of a glaze technique and there'd be a high probability that it would smear our colors. So there's certain techniques you can do in marker, alcohol marker, that you can't do in water-based marker and vice versa. I think both can have a place in any artist's studio, well, any artist who enjoys using markers studio. So while these markers are a little bit difficult for me to control and their blocky shape is kind of tiring on my hand, um, the fumes are not particularly overwhelming. I do find these markers to be a little bit dry and a little bit scratchy. Um, and that could be because I'm primarily using a bullet nib for most of my illustration. So that could be causing, contributing to the problem. But the bullet nib is easier for me to control than the chisel nib. So that's what I'm going to use. Found an area I missed doing black on down here. So I'm just going to go back in and fix that. And do another layer on the tulle of her skirt. And our aim is to really cover less. So each subsequent layer, we're covering less. We're building up color and contrast. Except for this in the background, which I'm gonna pretty much fill in. And that's hopefully gonna push it back. So I've also kind of realized that the very, very light, dark blue light that I used is a little bit lighter than I would like. So I'm going to try maybe pale baby blue 144 or number 77. Yeah, number 77. It's a little bit darker. Well, yeah, it's a little bit darker. Honestly, the color families in the Arctic's other than like so the first number denotes the color family. The second number is not necessarily how dark that color is. Yeah, that's a lot better. So I'm gonna use this to kind of imply shading on these translucent areas. And 
and do the same over here. So I would imagine for those with arthritis or for those with smaller hands or for kids and teenagers whose hands are maybe not fully grown yet, these markers might be a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit difficult to use. Okay, we're gonna use number 65, LCE blue, maybe ice blue. And we're just using that to kind of work the shadows on the tall. So you really want to use it very sparingly. And now we are finally on to 120 black. And I think we actually worked it up sufficiently so that it's not like too striking. I always find black is kind of a hard color to work with. I even prefer like brown blacks or carbon blacks to just, you know, straight up black. Because it often takes a lot for it not to feel disjarring in the image. Don't think disjarring is a word, but you guys know what I mean. Disjointed plus jarring. Isn't it fun when our brains invent words? Of course, if the black you're using ends up getting to be too much, you can always blend it out with a lighter color, which I will show you here on her skirt. Not only are we adding another layer of a very dark color, but it's also blending the black out just a, just a bit. Now, all I really have left to do are some detail odds and ends. This is going to be hard because these bullet nibs are very prone to bleeding out a little bit. I'm going to use green bice to do some of the smaller jewel details and that'll kind of, you know, harken back to her eyes. For jewels, they can be really simple, just a solid fill and then a little oval of the darker color down at the bottom or wherever is the opposite of the light source. her eyebrows green I think that'll add a nice got to be really careful because they wanted to bleed out really bad right there add a little bit of contrast though all right so we have completed the base portion of this illustration next I'm going to take some Copic Opaque, no, that's not what I'm gonna use. I'm going to use some probably P.H. Martin's Bleed Proof White, and I'm gonna add white details and accents to this piece. So since I like making my life more difficult, I thought I would add in an additional bonus component where I thought it'd be kind of cool to use Holbein's Phthalo Blue Yellow Shade to add kind of a cast 
to the whole thing to add another layer of depth. You can definitely do mixed media with alcohol markers and watercolor. I have a few tutorials. We're just gonna use this as a one color kind of thing. And this is a very, very, very strong shade. But since she's got so much grass around her, I thought it would make sense to kind of pull that in. So using a very light mixture of phthalo blue green shade, I'm doing some blue green kind of cast shadows onto, well, I'm gonna do everything, but I'm starting with her skin and I'm gonna do her eyes as well. And what this is gonna do is it's actually just gonna kind of pull the piece together a lot better. And I like doing these sort of mixed media techniques where I combine watercolor with alcohol marker because they are not going to react with one another. So you can layer your watercolor on top of your alcohol marker. It's not gonna reactivate. Instead, it's just gonna kind of put a cast over whatever you paint. And I know that it does not look so good right now, but it's, hopefully it will dry a lot better. I am painting on uh, plate bristol and pr plate Bristol does not like water very much. So um, I do have friends who paint on it and they have better results than I, but I always have terrible results with it. So I'm hoping this will look really good. I think it will. I believe in myself. So I have this really weak mi mixture and I'm just kind of using that right now to glaze the lightest thing. So like our transparent areas on her crown and on her fan and on her wings are all gonna get a very light glaze of phthalo blue yellow shade. And like the water droplets will get it. and the grass will get it, etc. So I think you guys kind of get the gist and I'm just going to mix it darker as I need to render progressively darker things. And you guys can probably see that a very little will go a long way. I probably put too much onto my essentials craft sheet. And this is just a silicone impermeated sheet, so it's not porous. So I like to use this as kind of like a mixing palette when I'm mixing very limited amounts of color. And this is a nice way to add some local color without, you know, losing the colors you mixed. Again, this is another example of how art is a lot like cooking we're adding a new flavor because we tasted our recipe and we thought it could use some more local color. We thought it was missing a flavor. So now we're adding that flavor in. That's also something that makes this kind of exciting because anytime I create something, it always ends up, I always end up taking it in a different direction or bringing in like a mixed media element or introducing a different product than like I'd originally intended on working with. So for me, there's always an element of the unknown. I think that's one of my favorite parts about art especially when I have time to think about things and be inspired. And with this cowl, she does kind of look like the evil queen a little bit, but I was just kind of thinking about how dragonflies have kind of, well, I mean, they have like little fuzzy hairs on their little heads, but like they kind of have like a smooth, almost like an aviator's goggles kind of thing going and I wanted something of that but I was also kind of inspired by like um like Elizabethan fashion a little bit 
so I wanted to have both elements. Now I'm going to add some shading to the, let me see if I can pull in closer for you guys, some shading to the dew drops. And I'm going to start shading in the grass as well. I think, I think this is where it's going to pull together a little bit more. So often with markers, I will use Copic Wides to provide kind of a wash of color all over the background, or I'll use um, alcohol marker spray mist that I've made. And what I like about that is it adds kind of a unifying tone to whatever image I'm doing. And that's a technique I use when I paint watercolor comic pages as well, is I will use toning colors to kind of unify everything, either on the page or in a scene or in the panel. just so that everything looks like it's being lit by the same light source and looks like it belongs in the same realm of existence. With alcohol markers, that can be a little bit harder. Um, I couldn't find my masking frisket, which is what I will often use to like, after I do like a preliminary tone, if I wanna do like the sky, for example, then I'll use masking frisket and mask off the figure. And then I can go in with like a nice dark, sky blue. Unfortunately, I could not find my frisket, so... But I think I might like this method a little bit better anyway. Um, I do have tutorials on how to use masking frisket with your alcohol markers here on this channel, so if you're interested in those, you should definitely check that out. Now I'm going to have to place this between some sketchbook pages to dry so it'll dry flat. But you guys can hopefully see how just one color can really help add a lot of depth and dimension that it was kind of, I felt like it was kind of lacking beforehand so now I feel like it's a little bit better tied together. And that was just one color. That was just a uh, Holbein phthalo blue yellow shade. Okay, so I need to allow this to dry before I can apply my Peach Martin's Bleed Proof White. All right, so now it's just time to add some white details using the opaque white of your choice. Maybe you like Deleter White. Maybe you like Copic White. Maybe you like Bleed Proof White. Doesn't really matter. Any of them are fine. You can also use white gouache, also fine. Recently, I did a comparative test to see like which was the best. And um, the bleed proof white is the most opaque. It's the easiest to correct over. So, you know, I guess I would say that is the best. So where you add highlights, it's up to you. Do it to your taste, just like in cooking. You might also decide you want to go in and add black lace work details on the, uh, the wings and the fan. In fact, now that I say it, I know I'm going to do it. I really don't want to do it. Oh, but I have to because I said it. Now I'm forced to do it. So for that, I'm going to need some reference.
Okay, so I think we're done. Ended up going a little bit mixed media, but I think we were also able to get a pretty good idea of how Artix alcohol markers handle. So Artix alcohol markers have a chiseled nib and a bullet nib. They are not refillable and I do not believe that the nibs are replaceable. You cannot purchase these open stock. In fact, they only really seem to be available in one larger set. I believe this is 72, but I might be wrong about that. You guys will just have to check out my unbox and swatch to see how many markers are in this set. There were, I think, no duplicates and there's a fairly decent color gamut, but it doesn't come with a blender marker and it doesn't necessarily come with the pastels you would need to blend out using those, but I didn't really have that much of a problem. On the plate Bristol, the colors are a little bit desaturated. That is an unusual problem. Um, it's new to me. And I found that it was tiring to fill in large areas holding this pen body. It's a little bit large, it's a little bit uncomfortable, and my hand really started to cramp up. So if you're prone to arthritis, that might be an issue. I also had some difficulty getting caps on and off, particularly quickly, which is sort of of the essence if you wanna get nice blends with your alcohol markers. I enjoyed using them, I enjoyed coloring. They were by far not the worst that I've ever reviewed, but they were also not the best that I've ever reviewed. So if you're looking for a very inexpensive starter alcohol marker, you want to get a lot of colors, you're not sure if alcohol markers are for you, so you kind of want to dabble before you commit. These could be a great entry point, especially for artists who maybe want to try doing cartoonier things or want to try doing manga inspired art. These could be a really good fit for you. The color range, if you're doing figurative art like that, is good. There's a good mix of light peachy tones and nice warm brown sort of skin tones that could work really well for rendering people, which is what we did here. I also introduced a little bit of watercolor as well as some white correctional ink just to add in the highlights. And I feel like doing that really helped pull this piece together. So I wanna thank you guys so much for watching. I'm gonna remind you guys that these markers were provided by Artex. They did not contact me beforehand. So um, they just arrived at my door. So I took this as an opportunity to review them on my own terms. So all opinions are my own. These experiences are my own. Any complaints that I pointed out during rec recording are legitimate complaints, actual issues that I had and that you might encounter yourself. I always like for my viewers to be fully informed and I like to be honest with you guys. If you have an alcohol marker product that you would like to send me to review, you can email me. I am open to it but I am no longer interested in purchasing various sets of alcohol markers to review out of my own pocket. If you're interested in hiring me or sending me a product to do a tutorial with, you can contact me via email as well. I wanna thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you learned something today. I hope you had a really good time. Unfortunately, I did not scan the line art for this, so I do not have it available for you to color along, but I do have many other line arts available to my patrons and through my Gumroad that you could print out using a toner-based printer and practice with. So thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys had a good time and I hope I will see you guys again really soon. Thank you so much to Artix for sending these, me these markers to review. So have a great day, guys. Bye.